good morning. This is DJ Lala, your host of Art Beat, here on OzCat Radio. First of all, we'd like to thank all of our listeners for tuning in to our Literary Dialogues program. Today is an exclusive interview with author, poet, Dr. Iris Jamal Dunkel, who has recently written a very important book about Charmian, Kittredge, London, trailblazer, author, adventurer, a very modern woman in the early 1900s. It's a great read. Welcome. Thank you. Iris, it's so good to meet you. It's nice to meet you as well. Thanks for having me. Uh, I know we talked before how impressed I am about all of your research and the way that you portray this beautiful woman. Thank you. She's amazing. Well, it was six years of research, so. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that's a long time. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. And you're a mother, too. I am. Oh, my gosh. It's crazy. And uh, Poet Laureate also. Former Poet Laureate, yes. Uh, Yeah. Sonoma County. Yes, of Sonoma County. Oh, my gosh. How did you land in Sonoma County? Well, I um, moved here when I was four years old, so I didn't have a lot of a lot of uh, choice in the matter. Um, and I have, um, I, you know, I still live on the property that I grew up on. Oh, even wow. though I moved far and wide, I ended up right where I started. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's beautiful! It really, really is. And uh, I also know that you are a teacher. Yes. And um, Napa Valley College, right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. And uh, tell us a little bit about that. Oh, I've, I, um, I've been teaching creative writing and literature and um, composition and technical writing and women's studies for the last 15 years. Um, wow. And I, I love teaching. It's, there's really nothing better than getting to um, watch someone kind of awaken as a creative writer. Um, so I, I feel like really lucky. I can't believe I get paid to teach creative writing sometimes. <laughs> Oh, wow. I would love to share that with the world, you know? I mean, follow your dreams. Yeah. Do what you love, your passion. And It is funny to think that, you know, when I was, um, when I've always wanted to be a writer since I was very, very young. That's the only thing I wanted to be. And um, it felt so impractical, you know, and I had never actually seen what a writer, I, I didn't have any models. Like, now we have poets in schools and things like that. So kids get exposed to it from an early age, but back in um, the 1970s in rural Sonoma County, there weren't a lot of models for you to, you know, become a writer. And so um, I was really lucky to meet Jack London at Jack London State Park when I was in sixth grade because it really gave me license to become a writer, that you could have a job where you just wrote all day and traveled the world and wrote about it. I was like, sign me up. That's exactly what I can do. You know, uh, you're, you're, biography of uh, Charmian is just that. I mean, I, I riveted. Oh gosh, I just love the novel. And Tom Stanton is here with us today. Um, and of course, he's read the book as well and um, also a poet like yourself. And, and he's joining in on this interview. Um, I can tell you right now he has a list of questions and directions that he'd like to take this interview. <laughs> but what would you like to say? Oh, I'm just happy to uh, share the story of a woman who, because of the way history was recorded, her life was erased for many, you know, for the most part. And the fact that she was a modern woman who didn't adhere to gender norms and that she um, she was intelligent and that she was an adventurer in her own right. I just want people to know that. That's why I spent, the, you know, it's not easy to write a biography. I wouldn't suggest it to anyone, <laughs> uh, especially if you're a poet like myself. Uh, but it was so important to me um, and also in my work moving forward to uncover the lives of women who um, have been somehow erased by history. And there are so many of them. So I am moving towards my next um, project already because 
it was it, it's really like I've always called myself a feminist like mm -hmm. my, you know my entire life but to I've never actually had something you know that I actually did that changed how someone was remembered mm -hmm. you know so when I first saw they 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 remodeled the House of Happy Walls which was Charmian's house and um, at Jack London State Historic Park which used to be just kind of a shrine to Jack London even though she yeah. lived there right oh. But they remodeled it, and they relied on um, a lot of scholars to help them retell the story. And they actually read this book in a much earlier form. And I, so I was one of those scholars that got to participate. Mm. And I cried the first time I walked through the House of Happy Walls to see, you know, Charmian's real life there. Like the fact that she had a child that, that died shortly after birth, and then because of the complications, wasn't able to carry a child to term, but she desperately wanted to be a mother. Or the fact that she was a serious writer and um, that she was um, educated and went to Mills College and right. traveled the wor world and wrote about it. Like, that was really not there before. And um, it was so nice to just see that we didn't have to see her through Jack London anymore. We could see her as her own person. That's what I like about reading the story. I totally get that. It, this, this book is totally about her and a modern woman. In that day, that was unheard of. Well, she has an extraordinary background, which you, yes. you reveal to us, uh, yeah. which is pretty, un uh, how about super unusual? And uh, not only for the time, but it could be unusual for now. Um, I, I have a question, I think, so it's actually going back to where you just began, and that is, uh, I was curious to know what age, you, you say grammar school, but what age when you came to the house and you had what I would describe having read the book as an epiphany mm. as a young person, that you indeed could be a writer. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe how old were you uh, for people that are listening? Uh, and what was that sensation? Mm. How long did it take? Was it a second, an eighth of a second? Was it when you left the building? I, I don't know, this is, you know. Yeah. Yeah, what was that? Because that really puts you where you are right now. Well, it, it was an epiphany because as you know, an epiphany is a point in your life where, um, you know, the actual direction of your life is shifted in yeah, some way. And time. so, um, I was in the sixth grade on a field trip mm. um, and um, in Mrs. Johnson's class and uh, we were just joking around like sixth graders do and of course I brought my notebook with me because I was always writing and um, when we went into the museum and I saw like especially I saw these like these uh, bags like the, the, the bags they took with them on the snark like the, the big um, mm. boxes and all of the artifacts that they gathered and his office, how it was, it was set up in what is now the House of Happy Walls, because um, the cottage didn't, wasn't remodeled yet. And it was really almost a, it was life changing for sure. It was like, oh my gosh, like I thought this was just, I thought it was just weird, you know, because I didn't pay attention in school. I just read books on my desk or I would glue pieces, to, like from the third grade on, I would glue pieces of paper together to make my own books and you know like just I didn't really learn anything else in school. <laughs> wow. what, was, what was the nature of that moment when you realized that you were not weird? Oh, Can it you was, tell us what caused that? What was that like the uh, the jump? You know? Yeah it was well it, you know this was I had two epiphanies I had one about prose and one about poetry okay. um, and the so the Jack London epiphany was like I felt this license like oh my gosh like there's a bunch of us there's so many people like that that's great like you know I'm not a weirdo and this is before the internet so you, if you thought you were yeah. a weirdo you were just isolated or we didn't we didn't even have TV where mm -hmm. I live so it was just me and my books you know and, and hanging out in the woods <laughs> but when I was in 7th grade um, someone gave me a copy of um, Emily Dickinson's work and it was the first time where I I had seen, I mean, I had read poetry before, but I hadn't read lyric poetry that um, kind of worked the way my brain works is just imagistically, right? It's like, boom, boom, boom. And I, I'm not to, not to say that I write like Emily Dickinson. I mean, one could only aspire to such a thing. But the idea is that 
I saw, I saw on the page the way that my mind worked. And I was like, oh my gosh, you can, uh. you can write this. This is even better than prose. So, um, How so? Well, for me, that's like... You know, I have to ask. No, of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. because I think it's an important part of the book. Because you have both. So, yeah, yeah, so I, um, while I was writing, doing the research for this biography, I would find artifacts and I would write about them poetically. Mm -hmm. Because and my next book coming out in March is um, called West Fire Archive. And it is um, many of those poems um, about uh, looking at her diaries, you know, that she wrote on the year ago. And going you know as a as a poet you're gonna feel that first right you're gonna i was i was like i really responded to her because she thought imagistically much like her mother so charmian uh. thought imagistically she loved poetry um she she wrote she didn't write poetry but the way that i could relate to her diary entries was imagistically and and so i needed to process it in the form of a poem so that i could take distance with it to create prose later, if that makes sense. As a poet, you have to play tricks on your mind sometimes to do stuff like that. It makes sense. Okay. How did poetry open that up? How, what was special about the process of poetry that allowed you to have those images then lead to? Mm. So why, why did it go from poetry to biography? Sure. Uh, that was because, um, in reality, I wanted her story to be told. Okay. So I, my previous book, um, Interrupted Geographies, is about takes place in Pit Hole, Pennsylvania, which um, after uh, the <laughs> sorry after yeah, so you, how could you turn that down? Yeah, I know, right? Like <laughs> yeah. that's exactly what yeah. happened. Is yeah. I was in the archives, I was working at Clarion <laughs> University. And I was in, in their special collections, which was because it was funded by the oil companies that were there. Uh, and I saw this, like, the history of Pit Hole. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God. Like, I'll yeah. see you in a day because yeah, I'm going right. to read this. So, <laughs> but when I found out what happened there, like, the idea that all of these, like, it was a boom town, right? Just it was like, the first boom. oil, wasn't it? It uh, was the first yeah. oil. In, yeah. Yeah, it was yeah, first yeah. oil that was discovered in the, you know, that was... And this is before, you know, we had cars and things that, right, that right. used a lot yeah. of oil. But wow. it was, a, uh, it, Titusville is where the first oil was found. And um, so this this industry just blossomed overnight. And so um, Pit Hole was built basically out of green lumber. within, And this one town, Pit Hole, survived about 500 days. And during those 500 days, it was one of the busiest post offices in the nation. So it was booming. Um and there was a lot of there was a lot of um, men there, and they were away from their families, and they were looking for prostitutes, and they ran out of like the local prostitutes, and so um, this woman, um, French Kate, who ran a brothel, got her um, uh, I don't know what do you call it, strongman um, Ben, uh, to trick women into thinking they were getting a job in a hotel, and then once they got off the train, they'd lock them in the attic mm -hmm. until they would you know, actually work with the, um, the clients. So they um, effectively mm. disappeared uh, for some amount of time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't, you know, they were, they were stuck there. They had to buy their way out and none of them could. Oh. And so when oh. I read that story and some of those girls were 11 years old, I mean, they were young. And so for me, <clears throat> when I read that, I was like, I got to get those girls out. Yeah. And so what I did was I spent like months and months writing these series of poems I, and I just, I, and it was so, such a, um, you know, changing experience to like have, instead of writing about myself, I was writing about a historical oh. moment that was not known, you know, and needed to be told. And it was really empowering. I also wrote a novel at the same time, which is um, about it. Um, because I started that, so that was my first experience of writing poetry and then needing a prose form to make it even more viable to an audience. And so, um, flash forward to Charmian, when I started to hear her story, and as a poet, I will always, like, I, I write almost exclusively about history and the history we've forgotten. That's really where I'm, I'm drawn, that story. Um, so I immediately was drawn to write poetry about her, but when it came to, wow, there's so many people that don't know this story, mm. I, I, I felt like it was my responsibility to figure out how to write a biography, sure. <laughs> which is no small feat, well. but al but also to get her story out there because yeah. I needed, I felt like, and 
maybe I was, you know, like, you know, as people have said, like, maybe I had some sort of encounter with her ghost or something. Wow. But I but, know. <laughs> but, it, but what happened was I was just, I, against all odds, I needed to get this story out. Somewhere, either in what I heard about your process or you yourself perhaps said, or maybe it was in one of your poems, um, there's an image of Jack showing up on a on a hill. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he's a, this bright light. Yes. And she's mm -hmm. never, I think maybe in the beginning she sees his face one time, yeah. but then the second time mm -hmm. she doesn't see his face, but she knows it's him. Yes. Um, and that sense reverberates through the entire book. There's almost a channeling. Mm. And because she's so, and you'll, you'll correct me if I'm off on this, but she's so intensely private. Probably was anyway, mm -hmm. and then with all the violations to that, yeah. uh, you know, uh, three times yeah. that I counted. Uh, one an accident and the other two uh, provocative. Mm. Um, moving towards the end, there's still this incredible sort of partitioning, this mm -hmm. incredible privacy um, with members of her family and so on, either accessorizing that, mm -hmm. enabling it, if you will. Um, or not, but you you pulled out somehow. You have pulled out what all the others failed, even in their. <laughs> you have to say Stone, right, Mr. Stone? I mean, he he's sort Fairly of the Stone, the, yeah. the glamour guy here for uh, really going against the grain on you know how it should be done, and you've really inverted that is mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say. You've Thank you for doing out. that. Thank you so yes. much. Oh yeah. You've corrected that damage, awesome. and then you brought her to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And well, I believe in a way that, that she would have intended someone with your nature yes. to bring it forth to us. In a way, well, it's kind of like so. the okay. Absolutely. I hope I, I, hope I did yeah. it right. You well, did you're, it. You're a sixth grader, and you fall in love with writing. You fall in love with the place. She designed the place. So yeah. you're in her environment. Yeah. Um, you've, you've got the whole picnic going. Wow. If you'll yeah. forgive the, uh, and you're infected with this thing, with the yeah. beauty of this thing. Uh, she rides a horse. She looks like they're one. Mm -hmm. she's, it's not she on the horse that there, you pick that up. I think mm -hmm. you have experience and mm -hmm. you have a background in doing that same thing yourself. There's just almost like you guys could be friends. That was she what was, could yeah, trust you. You know was, what I mean? When I started yeah. reading her diaries and getting to know her, really, and reading her letters, I did have that feeling of like, wow, we would have totally hung out. I think so. Oh, I love I'm a, yeah, yeah. She was a swimmer and I, I grew up on horses in the yeah. country and so. I I definitely connected to her at that level, which was it, it's actually dangerous when it comes to writing biography mm. because at first I was so empowered to tell her story and I felt so connected to her she could do no wrong, and then I was like, oh wait a second, she's human and <laughs> yeah. I need to. Uh, no one's gonna like her if I don't tell who she really is. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. that was a big part of revising it is to. Um, find all of her negative aspects as well and balance her out as a character. Well, mm -hmm. that part that you so beautifully delivered where she's on the boat and she, not quite suddenly, but she begins, she has her own epiphany and realizes that she's now free to write. Yeah. <laughs> because she's not redoing Jack's manuscripts and she's yeah. not having the other jobs so to do. So cool. Yeah, so for like mm -hmm. the first time, she can just take all of that energy and she's got so much energy. Yeah. Uh, physically and mentally, I was just... There are no boundaries. That, that's what I get from the book. Definitely. So, yeah, he got it, right? He got it when he met her. He did. So, yeah, male, male, female. It doesn't matter. It's just this intensity. And so here she is on the boat, and she gets it for herself. Mm -hmm. And you bring that home so beautifully, that moment. If maybe you could share that feeling since you're with her then. Do and, you mean when she's on the snark journey? Yeah, yeah, and the very beginning yeah. she kind of gets it like remember she changes her pants I'm saying this to you remember your book uh, you know <laughs> she, she shifts into different clothes she yeah. wears a blue we're, we're sharing this with uh, our listeners yeah. so yeah so I think the, they're blue yeah yeah so, oh, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, okay. what you're talking you're talking about a scene in the the chapter about her snark journey and the snark journey is yeah. when she finally and it's not the that, liberation I, right I, I and like it, it's not that she didn't write before that she had published okay. several articles um in fact she wrote jack london afloat in sunset magazine right. when she first met him mm -hmm. so kind of a branding of who jack london is right. uh but when she was on the snark it's that was the first time she felt like um 
she had the license to write on her own yeah. and write about her experiences. And it's, it's a really fascinating um, story because you have a woman going on a yacht, which at the time, you know, small yacht in the South Seas, which at the time was thought to be insane. That a woman, uh, like the woman is just going to... 45, 50, whatever that was. That's yeah. That. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, she actually, um, you know, people would write letters to Jack London before they went on the boat and they were like, you know, she's going to die. It's ridiculous. A woman can't, uh, she can't handle that kind of journey. And Charmaine's like, hold my beer. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and well, and you have her. You have, she is saying herself that with a sense of humor even, it's kind of biting, mm -hmm. but uh, sort of a normal woman <laughs> for that time. Yeah. Yeah, would not be doing what I'm doing. True. You know, yeah, and she's very specific about And I'm going to interject. So you. I right. want to just say one quick thing, and um, Jack London did say this, that she was a much better sailor than he could imagine being. <laughs> yeah. That's so true. She grew yep. up sailing on the yeah. bay with yep. her uncle, Roscoe. Yep. Yeah. Um, the, the, I wanted to give um, her words. Um, I want her. To, I wanted Charmian to join us in the interview. Yay! Um, so when, before she went, uh, you know, on the on the snark before they um, when they before they sailed, she wrote a letter to her aunt Netta, who she wrote throughout the entire journey. And th that was actually that and her actual personal diaries were the most true story of what was going on versus her edited um, log of the snark, which is the book she eventually <laughs> published about the journey. But in her letter, she writes, I seem to be coming into my own. In a way, getting back some practical results of my literary atmosphere. And by that, she means that she grew up in a family that was very literary. Her aunt was, uh, was published in national magazines. Um, her mother was a famous poet. And so for her to be literary was natural, right? Um, At home, with you and yours, and the rigorous following up of that education in my life with Jack. Without office life to vex and distract, my life is now all education, the very living of it such, and the work I do for Jack is practical education, and there's no let up. Wouldn't it be fine to go on writing? Perhaps I shall. So that, that for me was a moment in the letters that I read that was like, oh wow. So this is when she decided I really want this. Like, it's, it wasn't easy for her to write. She went through lots and lots of drafts. Um, but she was very much someone that when she, like like a lot of women who write about their travel experiences, like you can go back to a writer like Isabella Bird, who was a, a Scottish woman who traveled in the 1850s um, all around the world, like to South Korea, to, um, you know, to Japan, to... Um, Iran, you know, in the 1850s and 60s, right? And she did, like, part of the reason she would give, the reason why she did it, was so she could wear pants. Because <laughs> it was it was unheard of for women to wear pants during this time period. And so yeah. when Charmian was aboard the snark, she got to wear, you know, she made these pajama pants that were, like, her own, they were pants. And it's not like you'd go out and buy pants. It was the same thing when she was riding horses. She didn't want to ride side saddle because it's dangerous yeah. and you can't like split gallop skirt. so she yeah she yeah. split yeah. she took her skirt and sewed it up in the middle so that she could ride a stride and that's just kind of a great metaphor for who charmian was sure she just didn't want to she wouldn't abide by the gender norms but not because she was a huge rebel but because it was impractical it was exactly just, you couldn't be mm -hmm. the kind of woman she was if you abided by those roles she couldn't have been the great equestrian that she was exactly well, wouldn't have happened she, she would have fallen off it wouldn't have worked yeah no, she same would, you yeah. how would you how would you be on a boat with skirts and skirts well, she had and to skirts. do all the work when they oh were she sick, did right? yeah. So, yeah yeah i yeah. mean there's just no way without no. yeah yeah Oh, I'm just I'm just enjoying listening everything. I are there. The book is alive. It is serious. Well, it's a alive. great book, so yeah. the, no doubt. Um, are there like any non favorite <laughs> stories or favorite parts of the like your most favorite that you might want to read? Sure. Or reflect? That that yeah. would be really I, cool. I think part of what was really fascinating um, about this journey was learning about Charmian's life before she met Jack mm -hmm. and after mm -hmm. Jack died because that was a part that um, there were some amazing scholars that I got to you know 
follow in the footsteps of like Earl Labor and especially Clary Stas who wrote mm. uh, Jack Lennon's Women which was all about all the women that were in Jack Lennon's life so it was like a little piece of a biography about Charmaine so I with her blessing moved forward with this project um, but one of the things that um, came to mind um, was after Jack died she really was um, Charmian felt like she was of two minds, kind of like the Sappho quote that I have in here. Mm -hmm. I know, not, I know not what to do. I have two minds. It's the idea that she was gr a grieving widow, but at the same time she was liberated to become her own self again. And um, she goes to New York. She um, gets uh, granted the rights to write uh, Jack's biography. And this is at a time. This is before Irving Stone. Um, condemns her in, in his own horrible biography um, but she's already dealing with other biographers trying to tell Jack's story trying to make money off of it um, and so she she goes to New York and um, uh, but what in this letter she writes to um, I'm trying to find it I'm so sorry um, she writes to Jack's uh, a friend that she had started writing to after Jack died um, about what it's like to be of those two minds. So uh, Torde um, Arizona um, wrote to her just a few, you know, on page uh, 219, just a few months after Jack died. Um, she said, she wrote back to him, one, uh, she has two minds, one full of business and endeavor because I must, and the other, well, I find myself involuntarily groaning aloud many times a day then I know the raw wound that can never cease from healing. So she's really grieving, mm -hmm. you know, leave, you know, um, not being Jack Lennon's wife anymore, not having, they had a very sensuous and um, deep love for each other. But the last, she writes on the last day in 1916, um, so Jack Lennon passed away in 1916, um, she, and she wrote every day in her diary, but she wrote the last day of the last year of my wonderful life with my own mate man, Jack London. Tomorrow, widow. I began a new career altogether, weary yet unafraid. He would love me for that word. Good night, good night, old year, old life. Try me in London. Wow. So the idea that she felt like this trajectory of hope and inspiration even after, just after losing the love of her life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Boy, that is uh, love. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no way around it. Uh, when you can't mm -hmm. uh, can't distill it and can't explain wow. it. Wow. It just works. That's incredible. And she's able to convey that, as are you. So, uh, wow. Yes, as conjoining. But um, I, I think it's important to talk about the beginning. Yeah, I found the earlier one. Oh, you did? Oh, good. Yeah, it's a short bit you got on 124. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're in church here. <laughs> <laughs> Please turn to page. Yes. Uh, I seem to be coming into my own in yeah. a way. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where it sort of first happens. Yeah. Uh, getting back some practical results, and I love this, of my literary atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and you said that was her, you know, her growing up. And yeah. So, yeah. So she's actually recovering that yeah. memory and sensation and feeling. Yeah. And yeah. then you, uh, you're referring just now to that latter uh, state where that kind of returns, I think, without the direct memory of it. Definitely. I think yeah. not a lot of people know that Charmian grew up in a, you know, her story is kind of like the story of the West, right? Her, mm -hmm. her, mother, her mother's side of the family came over on a wagon train from Wisconsin. They came down to Utah and, you know, in... in the wagon trains, which they're not like the Western films that we saw, right? The they were um, they would go from you know fort to fort, so that it, in a train, so that they wouldn't be attacked because right. you know we were stealing people's land at that time. Yeah. Yes, so they were fighting back. Um, uh, and so that side of her family went to Utah, um, Salt Lake City, where she would eventually, where um, her mother. Uh, Dale, she went by Daisy, uh, would meet mm -hmm. um, her father, who was very handsome and oh, very yeah. charming, um, but also a lot older than Daisy. Um, but he was a he was um, 
uh, an officer in the Union Army, and he, but he had ended up in that position because his family was from um, Mount Desert Isle in Maine, um, a long time um, shipping family, and he heard of the gold the gold rush and just mm -hmm. came over to California mm -hmm. like many people and um, was um, in the foothills for years um, and very successful. Mm -hmm. And that's why when he enlisted, they immediately made him a captain because he was able to really command these groups of men that he'd been working in the hills with, right? Like um, trying to get gold. Uh, so it's just such a, like when, you, when, I, when I read the story of how, um, what she was, you know, the story of her upbringing, it just made me realize that no, you know, no one really knew that about her, right? The fact that um, she's a very, um, it's kind of the story of the West we don't, we don't get to know, you know, that her sister, like Daisy's sisters all started a school in Salt Lake City, um, and Daisy was uh, really, she started a clothing business when they got to California. Right. Um, they, you know, a lot of people don't know that um, Kit and um, Daisy ran a hotel in Petaluma called the American Hotel, right. uh, where they had some of the happiest sure. days of their lives, yeah. you know, before it burned to the ground. So it's it's um it's a past that there's you know it's not that Clary Stas didn't write about it, but I was able to expand on it because more information was available, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of a lot of information about Charmian had been lost, and so. It was lucky that I could find some of these materials and move forward with it. Is there drama to how it was lost, or is it just uh, sort of normal misplacing oh, of things over time? Oh, there's so much drama, um, <laughs> as there always trick is. Trick question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I mean, the reason I the the book begins in media's rest, so it's in the middle of things, right? So I I started the book at what I felt like was the worst thing that ever happened to Charmian. Yeah. And. Um, mm -hmm. She was, like we said, she was an equestrian and spent, like, would go horseback riding every day. And so one, one day she's up on Sonoma Mountain riding her horse, and the horse shied away from um, some wire and threw her off, rolled over her, and, you know, she was less than 100 pounds, and nearly crushed her. And so she was in the hospital. Everyone, all the newspapers thought she was going to die. And so she ended up having to, like, stay in the cottage where Jack died, like on her deathbed, you know, thinking she's going to die, trying to like get herself back. And she had this epiphany while she was there, just really, um, by herself so much and not able to like, she was, she was somebody that needed to use her mind all the time. Right. And so she had this epiphany. Well, you know what? I need to like, a, I, I need to find someone to tell Jack's story, you mm -hmm. know, because, um, there's, you know, my biography didn't take off and, um, I, I need someone, I need him to be remembered, right? And she also um, realized that she wanted to move forward with her writing career as well. And so it was like a big moment for her. And right after that, um, she was just recuperated. And, you know, the, the accident left her very isolated. She's a very social person, even though she was very private. Um, she was isolated. And so this, this man, Irving Stone, shows up at the ranch and um, immediately starts flirting with her. He's 30 years younger, um, charming as well. Um, the reason why, you know, she, and she bought into it. She was, at first she was like, who is this guy? But then after a while, like he was, he started treating her like she was a literary intellectual again, the way that Jack would have. And it made her feel like she was alive again, you know, and then he's like, let's go out dancing and, you know, in San Francisco. And she's like, oh yes, you know, she's a huge dancer. Um, and, and so she just felt like, this is amazing. Like a 30 year old man's in love with me. This is so great. You know, I mean, her, yeah. she was definitely flattered. Her ego was like, you do present along the way that she has some doubt. Yeah. Yes. 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 She's kind of going, well, you know, can he really be? Yeah. yeah it's yeah. kind of weird that he's yeah. so But she me. goes for it, right? Yeah. yeah. She yeah, goes yeah. for it. Yeah. yeah. And she signs away all her rights. So he yes. basically the winds. words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like they made her edit her letter again and again until. Yeah. It, it um, legally bound her to not be able to touch whatever he wrote. Yeah. And she um, oh, was really hesitant about it. But then what he did was he, um, he never really respected her, even though he was, he was just manipulating her the whole time. And so what he presented when he finally uh, published Sailor on Horseback, his historical um, 
novel is what we could call it, but it's a, um, it's not a biography. It's, it's something with, it's, he, his methods made it so it wasn't a, a real biography. Um, and many Jack London scholars would agree with me in that presentation. So it's not mind blowing that mm -hmm. I, that I presented this, but what he presented was this like ditzy woman who really hindered her husband's career more than helped it. And, um, he, he made it out that their marriage was like a spiritual mess. Like they were not, they were not very, um, um, well suited for each other, which is the opposite of the way their marriage right, was. Right. Um, but the biggest thing that he did was, and, um, his notes, like on all his, um, all of his notes on her, on this book are actually at the library in, in Berkeley. And so I got to see his notes and they were like, he read through all of her early diaries and took notes on it and was just condemning her the whole time. Just like, mm -hmm. I can't believe, cause she didn't get married when she was younger. She just dated men because if you're a career woman in the early 1900s and late 1800s, you, if you got married, you lost your job. You lost all of your career. Yes, that's right. that one bit you, you uh, speak right. to there, where um, if she were to get married, yes, she would like totally she couldn't go to work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. That was a stunner. Yeah. I actually did not oh, realize gosh, that. can you imagine yeah. Yeah, we condemn her yeah. reading what he wrote, no. what Irving Stone wrote? Uh, yeah, well, she was... And, it and it I would think, be but I think that's just the worst thing. It's important to say is that she, um, at the time when this happened, you know, women would have been condemned for not following gender norms in the way that she did. I mean, mm -hmm. she, Charming grew up in an open, yeah. uh, you know, her, her, her aunt and uncle had an open marriage mm -hmm. and it wasn't unusual in Berkeley at that time. It wasn't like, it wasn't like they were like crazy people, right? There was, um, you know, Victoria Woodhull, Woodhouse, who was the, mm -hmm. um, first woman to run for president, yeah. but she also was like someone who was her idea behind sexuality for women was like women get a choice they don't just have to be their husbands you know I don't know like you know like without their own sexual identity the idea that they right. they actually get to be a sensual person and so that was something that yeah um uh Netta and Roscoe agreed with and she was raised, um, Charmaine was raised to feel that way and so she looked at sensual relationships she, as something that were she would have several men she would be dating, like a modern woman would, right? Right, and, and several proposals and for and marriage. Yes, that, yeah. Um, and Mr. Stone was able to get away with what yeah. he got away with because she was actually thinking in those terms that she was used to attracting men Yeah. and open to the situation. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. in and a way, it didn't I, matter I, did to her you that think he, he knew that? Was he preying on that or did he just, was his ego just being happy? I think he preyed on that, and yes. And he planned from the very beginning that she was not a stellar character. Well, I think that's something that, sort of I think that happened over time. Yeah, for sure. Was I it him or was it perhaps the people around him who were pushing? Because it was syndicated, right? That was the idea. It was To him. keep it going. It was It was, it was him. him. It was him. Yeah. I, re so I read that and I know it was him. He's her as the hero. No. He hero. was yeah. something else. Yeah. 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 So that was huge in the book. That was, uh, yeah, I mean, it was really important to me to set up you're really why. suffering along, you know, she just opened her eyes. And yeah, you're this. like, who, and why? Listen to, and then um, her assistant, yes, Eliza. Yes, listen to that person, yeah, the, oh, the pragmatic um, Jack's, one. That's Jack's stepsister. Okay, yeah. okay, so um, Mr. Stone hit on her as well. Well, yeah, he approached her in a different way. Yeah. As, um, you know, more like mm -hmm. a mother figure. Yeah. Um, something that she really responded to. She wasn't she was a different type of woman than Charmian. And so Charmian really liked men liking her, right? Like she yes. was just, she was yeah. a good looking woman. Yeah. Um, and she was someone that, that, that flirting and everything, that was something that she thrived on, you yeah. know, and there, that's, I don't, I mean, that's, that, what was really horrifying to me was to read how, because Charmian, um, had this sex life before she met Jack, right? Mm -hmm. Um, he condemned her yet. Jack London was, uh, obviously somebody who had had a sex life before he met Charmian and he was married and had two kids so he had sex at least twice for sure <laughs> so it was so weird to see that and I think that's what was most offensive to me as a modern woman sure. to see that mm -hmm. and think wow like um, he condemned her because she didn't adhere to gender norms the way that 
he expected women to. Mm -hmm. So Irving yeah. Stone didn't like that Charming was like, well, whatever, I'm going to be myself, you know? And he figures it's just easy now because she's going to keep going that way. He can keep victimizing her, right? Yeah. Yeah, all yeah. the way through. You really, you really bring that along. It's, uh, oh, it's just a it's great super read. super intense. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, well, it's I, so I, tragic. I mean, it, it's yeah. just so awful. It's like, why doesn't she stop him, you know? Uh, well, yeah. she tried in the end by burning her diaries and oh, I by know. locking yeah. away her soul. Oh, you know, her, she gosh. locked her letters away at the Huntington and made it so no one else could and get to her, them. Uh, and then that, that made it so, and she didn't know that that would make it so that Irving Stone's story would stick. Right. You know, and so that, unfortunately, because of that, her story is not coming out until... Now. now, you know, thanks to, yeah. you know, it's uh, the people who were keeping the Huntington Library collection kind of under wraps have passed away and it's it's much more open and good. Um, Thank goodness. It's easier to get to that information. So like, you know, now when people write articles about um, like a friend of mine, Aletta just wrote a wonderful um, piece about um, Jack and Charmian uh, sailing on the bay and all mm. their different sailing Aww. on the Romer. And um, she was able to access the, the diaries and quote mm -hmm. from them, you know, so Charmian's actual perspective was there, which was wonderful. Yeah, that's nice. So the Romer is a thing. In, yeah, that's, I really became obsessed with, <laughs> with the Romer because it's not the snark, right? Yeah. So it's this whole other experience. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the uh, Dirigo was like such a huge ship that it was different somehow. And uh, where they went on that was very different and they weren't controlling the situation. Uh, Right. So there's like all this stuff that just, I kept going back in and and sort of swimming myself in all of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so when you're saying she's here, uh, you know, presumptively, but she's here with us in that mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, it, it's not a book that is a, fin a finality. Right. It's it's a really a living thing, an organic thing. It's a living, you organic her thing. to life in a way that people have She's not. alive and, yeah. and, and this book brings life to um, a lot of people, That's including great. myself. Yes. Oh, I love to hear and, that. And, I, and yeah. I love it. it. I'm trying to explain it to my daughter, and oh, it just brings out different things, and so she gets the book next. Good. You know? Oh, yeah, there it's you great. Go. Oh, well, speaking to take all these marks out. Speaking yeah. of that, though. Um, you had a, a question for her, too, and I don't want to. Well, I really want to know more about the book launch, and and how we can share with our listeners, yeah. you know, um, how to acquire your book. I know it's in in print, and I mm -hmm. also know that it's online. That's how I'm reading it. Oh, the Kindle. Yeah, because yeah. guess what? We have it. Yeah, we, well, we have it in <laughs> many ways. You don't, so we, yeah. we have to fix this. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Let, let's yeah. talk about that, because yes. that's really important. Absolutely. I know you have a book launch, and we want to hear all about Please that. Share, uh, yeah, the book launch as yeah. well as where they can get it right now of course. and uh, what forms they can get it in. So um, the book will officially launch on October 3rd at 2.30 p.m. Jack London State Historic Park will be, I'll be broadcasting live from oh, cool. the House of Happy Walls, Charmian's home. Oh. Um, and it, due to COVID, it's not an in-person event, but it is a live webinar. And um, there are... It's still some spots left, but they are, it's filling up fast. There's almost 150 people already registered. Super. So it's amazing. How do From we all register? over the world. So you register by going to jacklondonpark.com. Mm -hmm. And at the bottom of the page, there's a link to register. Um, to purchase the book, you can buy the book um, through your local bookstore. Um, or you can buy it um, from... Amazon, or you can buy it through Jack London State Historic Park. Yep. If you buy it through Jack London State Historic Park, I am personalizing every copy oh. um, because the proceeds go to the park. Ooh. Um, oh, and it's, nice. it's a great yes. way to do it. Another great place to do it is I'll be doing several live events. If you can't get into the launch, I'm doing several live events the whole that whole first week of October. So October 7th, I'll be reading at Reader's Books in Sonoma, again, virtually. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to my website at irisjamaldunkel.com, um, there's a calendar that has all the links to the Zooms, um, in case you want to Zoom some yes. more. Yes, oh, I know, we will. <laughs> <laughs> but again, if, will. You, if you buy a book at Reader's, I'll be personalizing them. Super. Um, and then I'll be reading again on October 8th. I'll be reading with the amazing poet, Forrest Gander, mm -hmm. um, the Pulitzer Prize winning poet. It's such an honor to read with him. Mm -hmm. He's going to be asking me some questions about the book, so 
Um, it'll oh, be great. it'll really be amazing, and yeah. that's through Copperfield's books. Okay. Um, and you can again find that on the on the calendar, um, and I will be signing books for that as well. So you want to? I know you just said it. Wonderful. But, um, could you give them your site address one more time? Sure. Mm -hmm. It's Iris I R I S Jamal J A M A H L Dunkel D U N K L E um, dot com. And um, my website has all the information about the book and um, uh, the calendar of events of where I'll be reading from it. Wonderful. Yay! Oh, this is super exciting. And Thank I do, you. I, oh, it's my pleasure. I'm very excited to get this story out there. Oh, I, we are too. Uh, what m may be the most poetic passage? Mm. Okay, so that's that's coming from Tom. Mine was definitely, and I heard it it was having two minds oh yes that okay. it, right. that answered mine but yeah. i tom's tom's got a poetic preference here <laughs> i can't let that go i, I, yeah, can't, I right. know I to cover it's okay that. Uh, but uh you have said and i believe it is true having heard your poetry live <laughs> by the way thank you uh, wonderful of that um poet first that's right Definitely. We I talked about that. So, I definitely, yeah. um, I'm once a poet, always a poet. Um, yeah. There's definitely... Wonderful illness. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is. Um, one thing that was important to me as I wrote this was that um, in each scene, you would feel kind of the sensual details mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. um, of what was going on, right? Image, image, and, and with images mm -hmm. that were repeated. Mm -hmm. So there's a scene of her going by um, Donner Lake on several occasions, you know, the Blue-Eyed Lake, and it's something mm -hmm. that I, you see again and kind of thematically repeated throughout the book. Um, I did that on purpose because for, um, for me, Charmian was an imagistic um, person. Like she thought imagistically, much like her mother, who was a poet, Dale, and um, I wanted to honor that because I think imagistically as well. So it was, it was a way that I um, kind of made sense of her life. Mm. Um, but one of my favorite passages is actually um, at the end of the book, which is I got to see a video clip of Charmian later in life. Um, she was able to host um, the actors who were in The Seawolf um, when they made a film wow. from it at the ranch. And um, it's like right before she broke her hip, right before her dementia set in. Mm. And so she was, it's like her last really vivid moment. And awesome. it was important to me to end the book on that. So I thought I would read that little last scene. Yes, please. Before Charmian fell and broke her hip in 1952, before her mind scattered and she stopped documenting her life and her daily journals, she presided over one last great party at Jack London Ranch. In 1941, when she was 69 years old, The Sea Wolf was made into a major Warner Brothers feature film. On March 21st, 1941, its world premiere was held at the luxury ocean liner, America, floating in the waters of San Francisco Bay. Charmian attended the premiere and gave a na nationwide broadcast um, about Jack and how he had written the book, the first she helped him edit and type. On March 22nd, after a breakfast banquet with an address by the mayor of San Francisco, Charmian and a host of Hollywood stars that included Edward G. Robinson, John Garfield, Mary Astor, Maria Montez, Susan Peters, Charlie Ruggles, Dennis Morgan, Jane Wyman, Julie Bishop, Alexis Smith, Marguerite Chapman, and Ronald Reagan, boarded three Greyhound buses bound for the Jack Lennon Ranch in Glen Ellen. 300 people attended a barbecue that had been arranged by the Chamber of Commerce in the winery ruins near the cottage on the ranch. Later that day, they attended another premiere of the film, screened at Sp Sebastiani Theater in Sonoma. A film clip survives of this celebratory day. Charmian is dressed in a red pantsuit and pearls. She's glowing as she greets her celebrity guests energetically and shows them around Jack Lennon Ranch. As she wrote in her diary, everything was a love fest. I'm the most conspicuous of all. In the clip, she shines as a great woman she was. Mm. 
Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, Thank you for having me. Beautiful. All right. Oh, that's great. Um, Laura, would anything that you would like to... No, most importantly is we're launching a book. <laughs> Charmian Kittredge London, authored by Iris Jamal Dunkel. Thank you, Iris, for sharing your time with us. Thank you. It's she's so busy. <laughs> I mean, oh my gosh, she's getting ready to get on an airplane to where Denver or somewhere. Yeah, you yeah, know, that's so your, uh, your tour. We we oh, I think it's good busy. Yeah, we <laughs> found yeah. A, a good time, a good place to um, record this interview, and um, thank you, um, Ozcat listeners, for um, supporting our program, Art Beat, and. Tom Stanton, as always, you're just the well, best. And thank interviewer. you, DJ Lala, <laughs> uh, to everyone and Laura Mullet. Oh, uh -oh. especially now they know. Uh, it's been a wonderful freeway, and I I have appreciated the star. <laughs> oh, absolutely, Iris. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you so wonderful. much for having yes, me. Yes, please, please check out the book, Charmian Kittredge London. A story of an absolute modern woman. Oh my gosh. And uh, we will be signing off for now. And we'll see you next week. Thank you.